I want to wish you all a, a good afternoon and welcome. My name is Ted Clement, Executive Director of Save Mount Diablo. We hope you are well amidst all the dynamic turmoil going on. There are certainly more challenging times ahead. It is also certain that nature can continue to nourish, connect, and uplift us if we go into it respectfully and responsibly. And this is especially important in difficult times. Regarding the racism that our nation continues to struggle with, it teaches us that racism is ignorant and out of touch with the reality of the interconnected and beautiful one natural world we are a part of and dependent upon for our survival. With much quiet and contemplative time in nature, John Muir, one of our nation's most important conservationists, came to realize, quote, we all flow from one fountain soul all our expressions of one love. God does not appear and flow out only from narrow chinks and round board wells here and there in favored races and places, but he flows in grand undivided currents, shoreless and boundless over creeds and forms and all kinds of civilizations and peoples and beasts, saturating all and fountainizing all. We stand with all who are working to create a more loving and sustainable world, which recognizes we are all a part of and dependent upon nature. Our land conservation mission here at Save Mount Diablo, where we work to protect nature and get people of all backgrounds meaningfully connected, has never been more important than in this time of a plethora of crises racial crisis, the climate crisis, the pandemic crisis, economic crisis, etc. We have a special gift of gratitude and inspiration for you, our supporters. This afternoon's Zoom presentation by Seth Adams, Save Mount Diablo's legendary land conservation director, who has been working for the organization for over 30 years. In these challenging times, we are working hard to uplift our communities with even more than our usual land conservation work. With efforts like this regular and free educational Zoom series focused on how nature heals and inspires us, the lighting of the beacon atop Mount Diablo every Sunday night so that we can thank our heroes, come together, and collectively lift our eyes to the light in nature. This afternoon, Seth will provide you with a presentation about the Diablo Range of which Mount Diablo is a part of and depends upon. Mount Diablo's connection to its 150 mile long Diablo Range has become even more important in this time of the climate crisis because the more intact natural systems are, the more resilient they will be. Recognizing this, Save Mount Diablo recently expanded our area of interest to include the relevant parts of the northern three counties of the 12 counties that the Diablo Range run through, runs through, i.e. the relevant parts of Contra Costa, Alameda, and San Joaquin counties. Getting out and connecting meaningfully and responsibly with nature during times of crisis like the current times is especially important as we know nature can help us heal physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Gratefully, because of your wonderful support, our Save Mount Diablo staff continue to work hard on conserving our critical Mount Diablo natural areas here. Together, we will continue to do great things to protect the ultimate foundation for our long-term health and well-being, nature. Seth, thank you so much for your good work and for providing this gift of gratitude and inspiration to our supporters. Please take it away. Thank you, everyone, and enjoy. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Seth Adams, as, uh, as Ted mentioned, and I've been working with Save Mount Diablo for um, 32 years now. Um, I'm, I, uh, I know a little bit about Mount Diablo, um, but I'm really excited to tell you about um, something that I'm not as expert on, and that's the Diablo Range. And the reason that is, is because no one is an expert in the Diablo Range. No one has really focused on the entire range uh, since it was first named um, by uh, um, a writer in, in the, the 1800s. Uh, it was given a, a, its specific geographic name in 1908. Uh, people know lots of the specific parts of it, 
uh, but very few people know the know the full range. So I want to I want to tell you about that and and how Save Mount Diablo is getting more involved in that. But I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about what we're doing right now because I want you to focus on both um, the the local and the big picture. We're we're continuing to do our work on a on a very local basis here. Um, acquisition focused on the main peaks of Mount Diablo. Um, and uh, while also looking at the big picture, looking further south down the Diablo range to how can we improve the situation there. Uh, the theme of these presentations that Save Mount Diablo has been doing um, is that nature heals and inspires. Um, and uh, uh, so do incredible photographers who capture nature. And in this slideshow, I really wanna thank Stephen Joseph Scott Hine and Al Johnson for providing a lot of the images uh, that you'll be seeing here. But as I said, I'm going to do this um, slideshow in three parts. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we're working on uh, in our acquisition program, especially right now. Then I'm going to tell you a little bit about the process that we've gone through to expand our geographic area, as Ted said, to the, the three northern um, counties of the 12 county Diablo range. And then I'm going to take you on a little trip through the Diablo Range and, and tell you about this, this story that's just beginning and, and that's going to grow and become rich uh, over the years. Um, as you know, Save Mount Diablo was started in 1971. And at the time, Mount Diablo State Park was just a little 7,000 acre state park halfway up the, the mountain to the peak. Didn't even include North Peak. That same year, Contra Loma Regional Park was created and far off at the edge of the Central Valley, um, the, the Bethany Reservoir and, and Clifton Court Forebay were part of the State Water Project. Those were the public open spaces east of Highway 680 in 1971. And you're looking at the geographic Mount Diablo there, the landforms stretching southeast uh, and into to what will be the rest of the Diablo Range. You know what we do. I'm assuming that a lot of the people who are here on this uh, on the Zoom presentation are insiders to save Mount Diablo, and some of this will be insider kinds of kinds of information. But we acquire land. We work directly with with landowners to acquire land. We work with park agencies to acquire land, and we've been quite successful at, at that. Right now, you're looking at our Vieira North Peak property there on the side of North Peak, one of the three highest parcels left in the county to be added to to Mount Diablo State Park. Um, and we're actively working right now to make that transfer to the state park. The, 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 act, the transfer is about halfway through, and we hope to be able to announce that sometime in the near future. Uh, on December 31st, we announced our Concord Mount Diablo Trail Ride Association project, 154 acres on the north side of North Peak. It's part of the missing mile of, of North Peak that you can see if you look at maps of, of Mount Diablo State Park. Um, we, had, uh, we had previously worked on the North Peak Ranch, but here's the, the Trail Ride Association property. It's spectacular, rugged, steep, incredibly diverse, uh, lots and lots of species. Um, we had previously worked with um, the Binkley family just below Trail Ride on the 87 acre North Peak Ranch. Uh, and we, we don't talk about it as often, but we're buying that property with an installment process. And so um, we're about halfway through the installments and protecting the 87 acre North Peak Ranch, also part of that missing mile of Mount Diablo. You can see North Peak Ranch right here. Um, just as the coronavirus um, uh, event that we're all sharing started, um, we signed a deal on, on a property called Smith Canyon. It's, it's one we've had in our sites since, uh, like Trail Ride, since Save Mount Diablo was founded. Um, and it's, a, it's an especially strategic property. It's a beautiful little canyon. Uh, you can see it right here, but more importantly, um, it connects up into our Curry Canyon Ranch property with a, a, a practical legal access uh, up through one part of the ranch into Curry Canyon. And, and you can see it right here. It's a, it's a broad avenue of a trail um, leading up into, into Curry Canyon. Um, and that'll allow us to do practical access into that last major canyon on the main peaks of Mount Diablo. You know that we respond to development threats starting in 1972 with the with the Black Hawk development. It, last July, we celebrated the, the transfer of most of the, the Concord Hills Regional Park. Um, the, the Regional Park District is about to approve the land use plan on that, which is the essential step before they can start 
opening up pieces of this new 2,500 acre regional park on the Los Madanos Hills between Concord and Pittsburgh. Um, here's the dedication there and the, probably the first part that will open up is the area south of Bailey Road here. That's the view over to, to Lime Ridge. But this is an incredible new project that we've been working on for, for over 15 years. In, in March, uh, the McGee Preserve project was uh, affirmed by the, the voters. A referendum was seeking to, to try and slow it down and stop it. Um, and that's one where we negotiated 93% uh, protection for that property, including um, miles of new public trails, paved and uh, um, uh, unpaved trails. Um, and that was approved by the voters in, in March. We're working on the trail planning for that right now. Um, we're, we're headed towards the Antioch ballot with our Let Antioch Voters Decide initiative uh, on November 3rd. Um, and the Antioch City Council will be scheduling that election this, this coming Tuesday. It's got the potential to, to add protections to three square miles of the Sand Creek area in Antioch. You know that our mantra is preserve, defend, restore, enjoy. While we own properties, we work hard to clean them up, to restore species, to build trails, um, and to do all of the things that make it easy to transfer these properties over to state parks and regional parks. Um, here's our Thomas Home Ranch property, for example. Uh, the, the park district wasn't interested in saving any of these buildings at Thomas Home Ranch until we removed 40 tons of trash and debris and now these Civil War era structures are gonna be saved. Preserve, defend, restore, enjoy. Um, once, we, uh, once we have properties, obviously, that the next step is stewardship um, and acquisition is, is one step, stewardship is forever. Um, here's our, uh, one of our Peregrine Falconry introductions back in the late 80s and early 1990s. We do all these things so that we can protect land, protect the resources, provide public access and the major tool that we have uh, is, is one that's familiar to you all. We take people out and we show them, we show them what's at stake. Uh, hiking, biking, cycling, equestrian riding, all of the ways in which people, um, all of the ways in which people enjoy land, we try to connect them with Mount Diablo so they'll understand our mission and, and help support our activities. Um, we've got hike series, obviously that's a little, uh, a little curtailed right now. One of the things that you can easily um, take advantage of our, our audible guides, which interpret various parks um, around Mount Diablo and show you loops and hike trails that you can do on your own. The most recent one that we, uh, that we introduced was the morning side of the mountain, uh, a guide to Morgan Territory Regional Preserve. And that preserve is open, the staging area is open, and you can go and enjoy it this weekend. So um, check out our audible guides. Next, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how Save Mount Diablo has expanded its area of interest, which leads to the Diablo Range story. And you remember in 1930, Mary Bowerman, our botanist co-founder, began her work on Mount Diablo, and she didn't know anything about it. She was assigned Mount Diablo to do a botanical flora, a kind of a survey of the botany there, um, and she didn't know why it was important. Obviously, she fell in love with it. Um, but it's important to know that she did one of the first maps of Mount Diablo at any sort of scale. It, it uh, evolved into the first state park map after the state park was, was opened in 1931. And uh, um, her map became the set of, of first acquisition priorities that Save Mount Diablo began with in 1971. So if you look at the park boundaries here um, in 1971, uh, the, the next step in that obviously was what additional land should be protected. And so that was based on Mary's map. Every year we would send in um, priority lists to state parks and tell them what was important to, to us. Um, here you can see a, uh, a hand colored map that Mary did um, showing various priorities, Northwest Perimeter, Mitchell Canyon, Curry Canyon and Black Hills and so on. Um, and that evolved over the years. We, it, it was accompanied by a priority list that we still keep of, of all the priorities that we're working with with the various park agencies. When I was hired in 1988 as the first staff, um, I was sort of um, looking to how we can communicate better and, and how, we can, uh, how we can expand our activities. Mary had been focused on the unique geology about Diablo and the main peaks. I, I didn't have that same sort of limitation I was focused more, again, not knowing very much about Mount Diablo on wildlife corridors 
and how we could expand to as big an area as possible um, to make sure that wildlife didn't disappear from Mount Diablo. For the first time, I just used a, an elevation line to draw a, a, a sort of oblong shape around Mount Diablo, um, which, which included black diamond mines, the area out at Morgan Territory. Um, this was before say Mount Diablo ever worked north of Marsh Creek Road or worked east of Morgan Territory Road. Um, and the whole idea was, what's the geographic Mount Diablo that we should be looking at? And once you, once you start looking at the, the topography, um, you can start defining what those wildlife corridors are. So this was a, an area that was about twice as large as, as Save Mount Diablo had ever focused on in the past. In 2001, we published a, a similar map showing the various parks and you can see um, just by gap analysis what's happening here. New regional parks are being created, other kinds of city open spaces and connecting those various open spaces starts to become uh, starts to become a priority. That, uh, it's again, just sort of simple gap analysis. If you protect the canyons and the ridge lines between parks, you're going to increase the value of the existing parks. Um, you're gonna create better wildlife corridors. And every five to seven years of our history, Save Mount Diablo has, has continued to expand the geographic area that we work in. Um, the last expansion that we did, which was about two, 2007 to 2011, we, uh, uh, we expanded uh, to include Altamont Pass. For years, we had been sort of paying lip service to the idea that um, while we're preserving all of this land north of Altamont Pass, uh, if, if Mount Diablo gets cut off from the rest of the Diablo Range south of Altamont Pass, it'll lose a lot of its distinctiveness. It'll lose a lot of its species. The mountain lions, the bobcats, the golden eagles will probably disappear. Um, and uh, so we started we started focusing some of our attention southeast. We started looking at planning areas. We differentiated between them in, in terms of where is our acquisition highest priority area, where are land use areas that we wanna use advocacy as a tool. Um, and uh, we started uh, looking southeast into to southeastern Alameda County and, and even into San Joaquin County. Well, as I said, we've been successful. Um, in 1971, the state park looked like this. There was just one park on Mount Diablo. Uh, in 2018, there are more than 50 parks and preserves on Mount Diablo. Um, a lot of them are connected and contiguous. Um, we've got 120,000 acres of protected land north of Highway 580. That's a bigger area than Point Reyes National Seashore. It's a bigger area than the Golden Gate National Recreation Area. Um, but again, you can see that if it gets cut off from the area through Altamont Pass, um, uh, we could lose a lot of what we fought for. By our current calculations, we've protected about 75% of the important lands north of Highway 580. Um, and uh, we, we're not losing that focus. I, I started the presentation by talking about some of our current acquisitions on the main peaks and the, and the gaps and, and strategic locations that we're protecting. But increasingly, we're looking at, at what can we do further south uh, to, to make sure we don't lose that connection. And uh, um, we're not the only ones who are, who are focusing on this. Wildlife agencies are looking at it. Um, and all of the, the agencies, the foundations, the people who've, uh, who've worked on the, this kind of wildlife connectivity say that the Altamont Pass Corridor, which is only about 10 miles wide, is one of the most critical linkages um, in the entire state. And part of the reason that's important is because the Diablo Range is also one of the most important um, and last unprotected major biodiversity hotspots uh, in the state. For years, I was telling people that the intercoast ranges were the last and most important next big great conservation story. Um, and in 2008, in his last year in office, um, President Obama, or excuse me, was it 2008? It can't be. Um, near the end of his term, President Obama designated the Berryessa Snow Mountain National Monument the intercoast ranges um, uh, west of the Sacramento Valley and uh, half proved me right. What that leaves as one of those last big missing places in the California conservation story uh, is the Diablo Range. And uh, as I said, most people, most people don't have any sense of the Diablo Range. Uh, it stretches from Carquina Strait. Um, it was designated in 1908. Um, there's no real definition of the of the eastern boundary, of the western boundary. It's a mountain range. 
Um, but there's argument about whether the, the boundary is the Salinas River and the San Joaquin River or um, the San Andreas Fault. What we know is it's basically the mountain range that that's between Highway 101 and Highway 5. We know it definitively starts at Cartina Strait and it definitively ends 150 miles south um, at Antelope Valley in, in Kern County. As, I, as you can see here, it crosses 12 counties. And a lot of those counties' boundaries are literally the watershed line between the Salinas River and the San Joaquin River. So it is, it is the spine of Central California separating those two watersheds. Here you can see it with major road connections and, and this tells you that there are almost no significant road, uh, roads crossing the Diablo Range. That's a good thing because it means that the Diablo Range is largely intact. It's a 150 mile corridor. It averages 3,000 to 5,000 feet in elevation. Um, it's, it's a classic wildlife corridor that's increasingly important in the time of climate change because it stretches north-south um, and as climate changes, species can move just as they have uh, over geologic times. Um, uh, and it also has elevation so that species can move up and down as elevation changes. The major crossings are Highway 580. And that's the, the place that deceptively gives most people their sense of the Diablo Range. You cross 10 miles of grassland and you think that's what the rest of the Diablo Range looks like further south. Um, and uh, in fact, the, the range um, expands to 40 or 50 miles in width. It's not just a single ridge. It's it's a whole maze of canyons and arroyos and mountains and peaks. Um, then you get down to Pacheco Pass that's, that comes out at San Luis Reservoir. Uh, and that's got a, a, again, sort of part of it's a deceptive grassland area. Um, and it's only when you really get five miles in and 500 feet up that you realize that the Diablo Range is Mount Diablo multiplied. It's one of the most incredible bio, biodiversity hotspots um, in, uh, uh, in the state. It's named for Mount Diablo, of course, but that's a little deceptive too because our, our isolated main peak that has great views in all directions is not, is not really um, uh, what the rest of the Diablo Range looks like. The highest peak is not even Mount Diablo. It's San Benito Mountain almost all the way down south at the southern end of San Benito County, which is over 5,200 feet in, in elevation, uh, but has much more restricted views than Mount Diablo and is a lot harder to get to. One of the ways that you can look at intactness um, is also just besides a uh, number of roads uh, is um, what lights look like at night uh, of this specific area. And that red triangle is Mount Diablo um, and the area stretching a little bit almost down to San Luis uh, Reservoir below it. Um, you can see that there are fewer lights in a lot of the Diablo range than there is um, in much of the Sierra. And the reason for that is not just because there are fewer roads, fewer people living in that area. Um, it's because it's arid. The, the Diablo ranges, the intercoast ranges, um, and it's sheltered from the, the coast and the, and the rain uh, by, the, by the coastal mountains. It's in the, in the rain shadow of those areas. It's more arid. That means that the water is there that, that is much more important. Um, but it also means that that aridity and that ruggedness um, has resulted in a hot spot for evolution as well. Um, botanists are, are convinced that evolution is happening at a much faster pace uh, in, the, in the Diablo range. And if you, uh, if you look at it by, by uh, the entire range in terms of cell service area and light pollution, um, you can see again um, the Diablo range, even though it's near millions and millions of California residents, is one of the most rugged and remote places in the state. Um, and that's demonstrated by the lack of cell coverage um, and by how much of it um, is remote from light pollution. What the Diablo Range is, this 150 mile set of, of ranges that, that um, stretch, 100, uh, stretch uh, north and south, um, it's really a golden eagle, mountain lion, California condor freeway uh, wildlife corridor um, that's going to serve us very well in the future if we can protect it. So I mentioned that Save Mount Diablo has, uh, has expanded its area uh, about three to four years ago. Um, we started planning for the next big geographic expansion. We looked at who was working in other specific areas um, and uh, uh, who, who needed help. Um, 
Uh, it was easier for us to say we should expand to include the rest of, of southeastern Alameda County and the boundaries of East Bay Regional Park District. They're one of our, our biggest partners. It was a little bit more of a stretch to say we should expand into to southwestern uh, San Joaquin County, uh, but that area has been kind of kind of walled off in some ways by preservation. The first thing we did though was we drew a map and hard as it, it is to believe, um, there is no good, good map of the Diablo Range um, depicting its public lands other than normal sort of USGS maps. So Save Mount Diablo put the first map together in history of the public lands of the Diablo Range. Um, this is the, the Northern Diablo Range. This is the one that people are often surprised because they, they don't think it goes that far south. You can see San Luis Reservoir down there at the bottom, um, just east of 80,000 acre Henry Coe State Park. And this is the full 150 mile Diablo Range here. Um, and uh, uh, these are different kinds of public lands that are depicted there. Um, the TAN is Bureau of Land Management Lands and there's 200,000 acres of it compared to 80,000 acre Henry Co or, or 20,000 acre Mount Diablo State Park. There's a lot of land that has some level of protection um, as you go, as you go uh, south. But I mentioned that, that north of Highway 580, we've protected about 75% of the area that we consider important. For the entire range, only 24% has any level of protection. Um, and that's both a threat and an opportunity. So what we realized was that, that in addition to, to working more intensely in the northern three counties of, of uh, the Diablo range, we needed to educate the public and decision makers about the entire range so that they would understand its incredible importance, the incredible opportunities that we have there. Um, and we started working on that map that I mentioned. Um, we started working on a, a, a big supplement to Bay Nature Magazine, which would be the first article ever published about the Diablo Range. Um, and uh, uh, to, do, to put that together, we, we did a number of different things. But I'm going to show you the range in a couple of different ways and then I'm going to take you on the trip that we did with Bay Nature Magazine. So we call it the spine of California and I mentioned it's the watershed divide and, and a lot of its length uh, for the Salinas River to the west and the San Joaquin River to the east. Um, but you can see that a lot of the high peaks in the, the 12 counties are right on the spine of the, the watershed divide between the counties. The highest points to, to give you some some locations and the, the green ones are publicly accessible. The red ones are on private land, but the highest point in Contra Costa County, of course, is Mount Diablo, 38, 49 feet. Um, the highest point in Alameda County is in the Ohlone Lone Wilderness. Um, it's called Discovery Peak and it's, it's uh, about the same height as Mount Diablo. It's near Rose Peak. Um, when you get to San Joaquin County, almost to Stanislaus County, uh, Mount Boardman is on private land. In Santa Clara County, people think that Mount Hamilton is the highest peak, uh, but it's really Copernicus Peak, a little spur, uh, not very far from Mount Hamilton. Once you get to Stanislaus County, um, it's Mount Stakes. As you go further south, La Viaga Peak. Um, in San Benito County, almost at the southern end of the county, San Benito Mountain is the highest peak in the entire range, but there are a bunch of four and 5,000 foot peaks down there around it. It's part of the the Clear Creek Management Area of the Bureau of Land Management. Um, and then in the very south, southern tip of, uh, of the Diablo Range, uh, you have Table Mountain, 3,476 feet. So I'm gonna show you a few of these places just, to, just so you get a sense of them. And then I'm gonna, gonna sort of drill into a, to a couple. Um, here's uh, the Corral Hollow area um, where Alameda and San Joaquin County come together. Um, lots of people know Carnegie Vehicular Recreation Area uh, next to the big 3,000 acre Tesla area that we're working to, to try and protect. Here's Mount Boardman down in uh, San Joaquin County, that, that highest point there. Here's there in, in Alameda County along the Ohlone Wilderness near Copernicus Peak. The slopes of Mount Hamilton. You know that Mount Diablo is a biodiversity hotspot. Just in 10, 000, 20,000 acre Mount Diablo State Park, there's 10% of the native plant species of California. Well, on Mount Hamilton, just in the mountain, on Mount Hamilton itself, there are 20% of all of California's 
uh, uh, plant species found there. So um, you, you can understand when we say this is a biodiversity hotspot, uh, it's, it's really true. As we go south through Henry Coast State Park, um, you get into the maze of arroyos and, and ridges and, and Henry Coast is kind of like Mount Diablo without the specific peaks sticking up. Um, it's got a lot of water. It's, 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 a lot of it is designated wilderness. Here's uh, Pacheco State Park on uh, Pacheco Pass looking out at San Luis Reservoir. This is kind of the dividing line between the Northern Diablo Range and the Central Diablo Range. Um, and this is the, the second and, and only major crossing of, of uh, the Diablo Range. Once you go a little bit further south, I, I mentioned we, we know the definitive north and south ends of the Diablo Range, but there's a debate going on uh, about whether the western edge includes the, the Oakland Hills, um, it starts at Carquina Strait, uh, but also whether the western boundary in the Salinas Valley is, is the San Andreas Fault or um, Highway 101 and whether or not it includes Pinnacles National Park. That's a, that's a debate that will go on, but this is Pinnacles National Park. On the other side of the Diablo Range, these are the Pinoche Hills um, and, and a number of different BLM management areas. Um, uh, this one's uh, uh, kind of surreally beautiful, especially in the spring because it, it includes uh, a bunch of species that we think about as desert species, blunt nose, leopard lizards, things like that. Um, and then uh, we get further south down to San Benito Mountain. San Benito Mountain is kind of like Mount Diablo, but, but with other mountains around it blocking the views, it's, it's not easy to get to, it's not easy to get a clear view of it until you're in the Clear Creek management area. And, and I'm gonna tell you more about it, but this is kind of following the spine of the watershed line down the Diablo Range. Um, and uh, uh, it gives you, gives you kind of a sense of, of what's there. Um, when you're looking at the Diablo Range from Highway 101 or from Highway 5, what you basically see are grassland hills. And as I said, you have to get in five miles and, and increase your elevation uh, 500 or 1,000 feet before you see the incredible diversity that, that's down there. But those grasslands make it a, a really important area too, both for, both for ranching and, and cattle, uh, but also for golden eagles and raptors. The grasslands are the, the bottom of the food chain for all these incredible predatory birds we have. Um, and you know that Mount Diablo and the Diablo Range are the, the location of the largest concentration of nesting golden eagles in the entire world. We know the threats to the Diablo Range. They're pretty familiar to us up here on the north. They're, they're uh, development proposals like here in Pittsburgh. And as we, as we extend uh, um, uh, east and then south along the Diablo Range, um, they transition uh, as we get away from the, the Bay Area into other kinds of, of uh, threats. We all support alternative energy, uh, but there's no question that windmills and solar panels uh, can use up large amounts of land um, and, and they have consequences of their own. They drag transmission lines and transformers and all kinds of, of industrial energy in, uh, infrastructure along with them, fragmenting land, blocking wildlife, et cetera. So uh, they're a, they're a something that we need and also something that we have to balance and manage well. Off-road vehicle uh, areas are, are found in a number of places in the Diablo Range. Carnegie is one of the most obvious in Corral Hollow um, and uh, uh, there is a proposal to uh, expand it there. Um, that was one of the reasons that we expanded our geographic area so that we could have a, an impact there and we're helping the friends of Tesla uh, to try and and uh, address that, that expansion proposal. We're not trying to go down and be the savior of the Diablo Range. We're looking for collaborations and how we can play our part on the north especially, but how we can also use our expertise uh, to help uh, local citizen groups and other kinds of organizations as we go south uh, and they do advocacy of their own. The high-speed rail proposal is supposed to go through Pacheco Pass if it ever gets out of the San Joaquin Valley. Um, that could introduce uh, all kinds of impacts, but it could also uh, mitigate by the protection of thousands or tens of thousands of acres of land. Any place there's water, there are proposals on how to use the water. Diablo Grande is a uh, residential development um, uh, west of the town of Patterson. Um, and uh, when, it's, uh, when it's completed, there's supposed to be 6,000 people there. It's about one third completed. Um, 
but that gives you a sense that even in the San Joaquin Valley along, along the edge of small, uh, small towns like Patterson, um, there's pressure from the Bay Area by commuters and there's pressures for luxury estate homes up in the hills. We had not, um, we, we had expanded our geographic area and it wasn't six months before um, we got the opportunity to play a small part in something that's ongoing. And, and you've probably all heard about um, the N3 cattle company, the, the 50,000 acre, 500, 50, acre um, mega ranch um, that's, that's up for sale um, south of Livermore. Um, it would stretch through four counties. Um, and uh, we've been helping with some of the collaboration between a number of bigger players because we often have local knowledge that can help them. Um, this, this, this project is 50% larger than the city of San Francisco. Uh, oh, wow. And if it's gonna happen, and there's a, there's a good chance it could happen, especially in an economic downturn, it's gonna happen because of cooperation between a bunch of agencies like East Bay Park, Santa Clara Valley, Open Space, um, uh, Department of State Parks and, and so on. So uh, this is something we're, we're actively working on. Um, uh, it's not our, our highest priority pro project. Uh, the most important reason N3 is important is because of the way it can connect from Corral Hollow south almost to Henry Co and back up to Del Val. It would, it would provide for incredible connectivity. Of course, this work that we're doing, only 24% of the Diablo range has, has any level of protection. Um, most of it is in large cattle ranches or is so rugged that, that not much is happening on it. Um, a lot of this is going to happen through working with private landowners, uh, acquiring conservation easements, um, doing all kinds of things to, to uh, work with the landowners who are already there uh, to try and increase the levels of protections on their land. Um, so, as I mentioned, uh, we, we worked with Bay Nature to do a supplement in their March issue um, a lot of you, if you're on our mailing list, list will receive a copy of the, of the supplement this month. Um, but when they, we first started talking to Bay Nature, um, they said, we need a writer who's going to be the John Muir of this area and who's going to really expose it to the public for the first time. And our response was, there is no John Muir of this area. John Muir wrote his books about Yosemite in his old age after he had, after he had spent decades becoming a an expert in it. What we're really looking no. for is um, the William Brewer of the Diablo Range, because this is going to be a survey and exploration, uh, somebody exploring this area for the first time um, and exposing it to people. The Diablo Range article in, in the, the March Bay Nature magazine is the first article in history to focus on the Diablo Range, and it includes the first public, the first published map ever to show the public lands of the of the Diablo Range, but part of the way that we uh, part of the way that we we provided a thread for the narrative of that supplement was we said let's do a trip up and down the Diablo Range. The, the same idea is up and down California. William Brewer's journals of the of the Whitney California Geologic Survey back in the 1860s. We'll take a car trip. We'll stop at a number of places along the way and sort of expose the the issues and resources of this area to the public and and to decision makers. And it's the kind of thing we're going to be doing for decades uh, to, to educate people to the importance of the area. And we took two photographers along, Stephen Joseph and Al Johnson. And the last part of this slideshow is just going to be some incredible photos as we go through a few parts of the Diablo range. We, uh, we wrapped around uh, Mount Diablo on the north and down past Pittsburgh and Brentwood. Uh, we veered over to Mines Road in Livermore. And if you've never been down Mines Road, it's like Morgan Territory, Morgan Territory Road multiplied. Uh, incredible. You go south uh, through remote areas, rugged, um, and you come to a T intersection. You can either go west to uh, uh, Mount Hamilton and San Jose, or you can go east on Del Puerto Creek Road um, down to Patterson and, and through Del Puerto Canyon. Uh, we learned in December that there was a proposal for an agricultural reservoir there, with, which would drown three miles of this incredible resource. Um, and we found some local groups who are, who are going to be working on that. Um, and we've started working with them just in the last few months to, to give expertise and help them to uh, address that proposal. So this was on our, our Bay Nature tour in, in December. Um, we're, we're at a part of a, a Pinoch Creek that would be underwater if this agricultural reservoir is built. Um, 
as you go up, uh, the trees start emerging from the creek and it gets, uh, it gets incredible, incredible, but um, we were moving very fast. Uh, we stopped just down in the proposed reservoir area um, and you can see, uh, you can see what we're talking about here. Um, uh, how sublime this, this area is. Um, we were lucky that we, uh, we were lucky that we waited until, uh, um, uh, that we waited until December, the rains had come in, things were greening up and, and, and starting to get more interesting. You know what the west side of the Diablo range is like. It's a lot like Mount Diablo. It has, has more uh, rain, um, but it, just as the Diablo range is in the rain shadow of the outer coast ranges, um, the east side of the Diablo range is even drier. It's in the rain shadow of the Diablo range too. So you go from 23 or 25 inches of water um, in Danville or in Oakland, and you get to 14 and 11 inches in Brentwood and Livermore. Um, the, the area along the, the west side, excuse me, the eastern edge of the Diablo Range is now being designated as a new vegetation community called the San Joaquin Desert. Um, there are very few trees there, and it's ideal habit for the San Joaquin pit fox, uh, which is one of the species that that's, uh, uh, represents the, the western, excuse me, the eastern Diablo Range. Here's another, another view of Pinoche. Uh, we don't know if there are kit foxes there. It's one of the things we've asked them to investigate. Um, and uh, like I said, we're lending expertise there. As we headed south, we veered over into the Pinoche Valley. And if you've never been there, it's kind of like the Livermore Valley before development. Beautiful, sublime grasslands, uh, huge flat areas. Um, you go past Mercy Hot Springs. Um, one of its most famous residents are called blunt nosed leopard lizards. These these desert-like lizards that jump two feet in the air to catch insects. Um, also, San Joaquin kit fox, road runners. Um, and the reason that we go there is because um, uh, we're, used, we're used to landowners supporting development proposals. Um, and there's a big debate going on in the Pinoche Valley because um, uh, thousands of acres of the valley, are, which is incredible habitat for rare species, are being proposed for solar cell farms. And, those black splotches on the right side of the road down there are solar cells stretching across the landscape. Down as you follow the road into the distance, there's a whole big industrial transformer site to manage the electricity from all of those things. And even, even solar power, which seems, seems benign, as I said, it drags transmission towers and, and industrial scale infrastructure with it, fragmenting habitat. Um, so you go to the Pinoche Valley and you see that not all the ranchers are in favor of it. Um, some of them are, are opposing it, and we're looking for those kinds of situations uh, where we can help existing landowners uh, face some of the, the development threats that they may have less experience dealing with than we do. Aren't Stephen Joseph's photo sublime? You wouldn't believe it, but we were like, uh, <laughs> there were times here where, where we'd stop the car because there was great light, and it was like, okay, guys, you got two minutes. Take these photos. The light's fading, we gotta get out of here. Um, and uh, they came up with incredible stuff. Partly it was for the Bay Nature Supplement. Um, and and uh, uh, partly it's just because they're such incredible photographers. We, we went down through Harris Ranch and ended up in the Coalinga Valley. If development threats and alternative energy are the big threats on the north, the fading threat in the south are the oil fields of the Coalinga Valley. And the reason we, we went down here um, was that we wanted to come up into the, the Clear Creek management area of the BLM um, and make our way to San Benito Mountain. Um, so we're, we're dropping down into Coalinga here. That's the Diablo Range that you're looking at, the, the central to southern Diablo Range. Um, and San Benito Mountain is off to the right, but you can't see it at this point. It's not a major road going through the Diablo Road, but the Coalinga Road, which becomes uh, uh, Airway and Highway 25 going back north past Pinnacles, uh, is one of the coolest entrances through the Diablo Range. It's, it's a, a narrow two-lane road. Um, I was on it a couple months ago when, when rock slides and a rainstorm were blocking it. This is not a, this is not a, an, a, a dependable route, uh, but at least it's paved. Through a lot of the Diablo Range, what you're looking at are unpaved roads. Um, when you get to the Clear Creek management area, the first thing that you do is you cross uh, the San Benito River. Um, and uh, like I said, in an arid landscape, water is incredibly important. The San Benito River 
uh, is a 109 mile river stretching, stretching north through uh, um, uh, San Benito County, um, ending up over in, in Watsonville and, and going out uh, near Monterey. Um, Hernandez Reservoir is just downstream from this. There are Tule Elk and Pronghorn here. Uh, and Clear Creek veers off of, uh, of San Benito River and rises up into the Clear Creek management area and onto the slopes of San Benito Mountain. This is Clear Creek here. Um, and uh, the area, you can go there now. You can drive to the top of San Benito Mountain if, uh, if the road conditions allow it. Um, but imagine that you're going to Mount Diablo and it's 14 miles from the bottom to the top. Um, and San Benito Mountain is 16 miles, all of it unpaved. First, you do 12 crossings of Clear Creek. Um, and uh, uh, Clear Creek had been a, a, a very popular off-road vehicle area, but it has large deposits of serpentine and naturally occurring asbestos, which also means large, large numbers of rare plants. Um, but it was, it was dangerous to breathe when it's dusty and dry, which is the, the, the flip side of off-road vehicle use. And so they closed it off and made it a, closed it off to off-road vehicles um, and made it uh, um, by permit only. To get to the top of, of San Benito Mountain through these serpentine barrens, you have to get two different permits. And there, you have a limited number of days of the year um, that you could visit. Um, so uh, we got our two permits. Um, we were lucky enough that road conditions, despite recent rain, uh, made it possible for us to, to get up to the top of the mountain. Um, and we're going through some of these incredible serpentine uh, areas, uh, various kinds of, of rare soils. The state's rarest mineral is found on San Benito Mountain, Benitoite. Um, and uh, this, is a, this is a botany hotspot. Lots and lots of different kinds of rare plants. Lots of colors of soils from the, the complex geology that's happening there. We're, uh, we're about a third of the way at this point, um, uh, still down in these serpentine barrens, and then we're gonna rise onto the wooded slopes of, of San Benito Mountain. Um, the views are incredible, but unlike Mount Diablo, which is an isolated mountain with clear views in all directions, um, there are threads of mountain ranges in every direction on San Benito Mountain. That makes it hard to see it from a distance, uh, but it really does that thing about inspiring you that nature can um, and showing you that, that this is a rugged, remote, um, uh, even though it's not very far from any of us, it's a rugged, remote area. Um, it feels like wilderness and uh, uh, it heals you to go up there and, and experience this place and, and think about uh, what we can do to, to help protect it. You know how December is for views. Uh, we had times when the clouds were filling the sky and times when what looked like fog were crossing the landscape um, and uh, uh, times when the views were clear in, in every direction and towards the Big Sur and the Santa Lucia's in this direction, um, off across the Central Valley to the snow-covered Sierra there, um, uh, north up to the Pinoche Valley, which we had been in the day before. You can see that big giant grassland valley of Pit Fox and solar cell proposals. Um, it's a, an incredible place. And that was our, here, uh, Ted and I are the highest uh, people during, in this photo. We're the, the highest people in the entire Diablo range uh, for that particular moment. Um, and one of my great, my favorite views from San Benito Mountain down into the Pinoche, past New Idria. Um, and as I said, this Bay Nature magazine, in which we helped sponsor a 12-page supplement, the first ever about the Diablo Range, a lot of you will be getting it in your mailbox or by email uh, in the next month. Um, and uh, it includes the first ever published map of the Diablo Range. Um, it's it's turned, uh, turned sideways here, so you see the Bay Area on the left, um, Monterey Bay below, and, and Antelope Valley on the right. Um, you really get the sense of how the Diablo Range um, connects the Outer Coast Ranges to the Central Valley. And uh, you can see that, that area that's been protected and the 76% which hasn't. Um, we're going to work intensively in the northern three counties of the Diablo Range and we're going to educate the public uh, about the entire range 
so that we change that 24% to something considerably more over the decades to come. Thank you. Okay, Seth, we have a question. To what extent are you collaborating or at least establishing contact with native and tribal organizations? Uh, we are, and, and that's, that's what I would say of it. We're, we're doing a number of things specifically to address those kinds of contacts, including uh, planning a, a, a meeting of a bunch of representatives in order to get their point of view on, on some different issues. We're doing some uh, interpretive materials based on uh, some of those collaborations. Um, our, our new land programs director, Sean Burke, um, who's part Native American himself, is, is going to be involved in, in heading up that. And uh, uh, all I can say is we are. It's not easy to do. Um, part of the Diablo range is, is kind of absent from Native representation um, uh, for uh, quite a while. But when you look at the Diablo range supplement that we're going to be sending you, um, or that you can request by emailing us or calling our office, um, uh, you can read more about uh, the Native Americans of the Diablo Range. Um, are there any wild, current wildlife crossings under Highway 580 right now? If not, is anyone working on this? We're working on it. Um, when uh, Contra Costa Water, did, we, had, we had already done some of the mapping of the wildlife crossings that exist. Um, and that's not even to talk about the ones that could potentially be created. Um, and when, Los, when Contra Costa Water District expanded its Los Vaqueros Reservoir the first time, um, they were going to drown a, a, a grassland corridor on the west side of the re reservoir. We really pushed for mitigation to include some entire wildlife corridors. Um, and they bought three properties on either side of Highway 580, uh, which include the, the first two protected cattle tunnels underneath the freeway from the Mount Diablo side to the, the Diablo Range side. Um, we, we, we were even talking with them about places where the California aqueduct could be bridged over to recreate connectivity. Um, east-west. But a lot of people are north-south biased, especially in the Bay Area, because the ridges go that way. And think about wildlife corridors following ridges. We're equally focused on the wildlife corridors going east-west between uh, Mount Diablo, the Diablo Range, and the Central Valley. Next question. Um, given the push toward alternative energy sources, will it be impossible to stop the installation of these large solar and wind facilities? Will it be possible to stop them? No, right. and, there, and there are places where we should actually encourage them, but it's always about finding a balance. And if you look at the, the 1970s and the push for wind energy that happened because of tax credits during Jerry Brown's uh, gubernatorial administration, the first one, um, uh, a lot of towers, thousands of towers were built in Altamont Pass and they started killing raptors and by the thousands. And as the technology aged and, and repowering projects started, um, uh, we and others started focusing on how you could replace the old technology with better technology that was better sighted and would have fewer impacts. Um, and along with better sighting and, and better, better uh, uh, technology, um, how can you use these impacts uh, to protect thousands of acres of land to, to help maintain that balance between resources and, and energy needs. So we're involved in all kinds of alter alternative energy projects to try and make them better. Um, trying to see if there was anything else. Anyone else have any questions? <laughs> mm, will you need help with the next survey trip? <laughs> That's um, a, oh, here, here's one. Can you give us a high level overview of how the endangered birds and animals are doing in the range or around Mount Diablo itself? Uh, First, the survey trip, uh, we use volunteers for all kinds of things. Um, most of the people on that trip were, were volunteers like Stephen Joseph and Al Johnson, the, the trip we did in, in December. And yes, we will be doing additional trips and tours and taking people and showing them things. And uh, we can always use more volunteers. It's a little more complicated right now. Um, how are the endangered birds and animals doing in the range in and around Mount Diablo itself? Uh, well, we've protected a lot of land in the northern part of the Diablo Range, and that's helped the ball. And uh, I, I would argue that in a lot of the area that we work, um, wildlife is doing better than it was before we started our work, not just because of the land that's been protected, 
despite all of the development, uh, but because the land is being managed differently. Um, and a lot of things that were being poisoned or shot um, aren't anymore. And so a bunch of things that became rare are now becoming more common, whether it's American badgers or red-legged frogs or, or things like that. Um, in the rest of the range, uh, its biggest advantage is ruggedness. Um, a lot of it, uh, a, a lot of the areas that we're used to seeing, we see 95% non-native species, especially grasses. Um, the ruggedness and the, aridity, the aridness of the Diablo range means that there are lots of places you go where 95% of what you see are native species. Um, it's doing well, but it's going to continue to be, to be assaulted by proposals that will fragment it, push roads through it, um, power lines, things like that. And so the more fragmentation, uh, the, the more the impacts. Uh, and uh, people need to address that. We're, we're, we're going to help with that. Um, which conservation groups are you working with on the southern end, uh, the southern end of the range? At this point, none. But but we're looking for we're looking for partners. We're we're working with some conservation groups. As I said, at, when we see a proposal that we could work on, like the Del Prado Reservoir, uh, Wester Patterson, we look for local partners and and how we can not you know save the day, but but you know help amplify their efforts or bring in expertise that they don't have. So. At the southern end of the range, uh, other than the sort of normal statewide environmental groups, Sierra Club, Nature Conservancy, and so on, um, we haven't found any local groups yet, um, but we will. Um, I think I can put one more last one in here. There are a couple people asking about to hear more about the planned reservoir and the impact um, to the land. Um, if we're going to take a position uh, or propose uh, the proposed reservoir in Del Puerto Canyon. Uh, what we've done so far is the, the reservoir has to have both state and federal level environmental review and we've, we've commented on the project uh, at that level. Um, we haven't taken a specific, uh, a specific position, but whether we oppose or whether we push for a big balance of, of preserved land as mitigation, the fact is that reservoir includes 14 alternative locations, in the, most of them in the Diablo Range, all of which would have big impacts too. So um, uh, we're gonna have to keep addressing those kinds of things as we do around Mount Diablo, uh, if we're gonna protect the special places going south. Um, uh, I think we have a web page up now about Del Perdo Reservoir, um, or it's in our advocacy area. Um, if not, we will soon. Um, and uh, we can easily send you our, our comment letter, but if you just, if you just uh, Google Del Puerto Reservoir, you're going to come with, up with some of the local opponents uh, pretty quickly. And uh, um, it's, a, it's a really special area. The whole 33 mile long creek is a thread of green that attracts huge numbers of birds. Um, a lot of birders know it very well. And it, there's a road of the entire length of it. So it's easy to access in various spots and, and uh, look at the wildlife there. And, and it's one of the most beautiful drives in, in the Diablo Range. So, Drive Del Puerto Creek Road, drive Mines Road, and, and get a sense of this area uh, that we're talking about. Um, I just want to let everyone know that I'll send a recording to everyone tomorrow. Um, we'll also send a link to the um, Bay Nature Supplement that's on our website and any other um, information that we have on our website about the Diablo Range. And Seth, thank you so much for the outstanding presentation. You did a terrific job, and I know a lot of people really appreciated it, uh, including myself. Uh, we have some upcoming, really inspiring Zoom presentations uh, in the coming weeks, so please stay tuned for more details. Uh, for all of you supporters who have joined us, please know how grateful we are for you. Please stay safe and well. Uh, we know that together we will continue to do amazing things to protect this ultimate foundation uh, for our health and well-being nature. Take care and thank you all.